<laughs> oh, hi. You caught me playing Nintendo at Stargazer Comics in Tacoma, the home of vintage toys, video games, back issues, modern issues, and so much more. Hey, speaking of old school Nintendo, let's talk about licensed comics today. Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your host Chris. You know, the original comic books were all reprints of newspaper strips. So, similarly, it's not a surprise that licensed comics have always been a big part of the output of the comic book industry. A licensed comic is when a comic publisher pays a fee to have the rights to make news stories about a property that originated outside of comics. I'm talking a TV show, a movie, a toy line. Those are all examples of things that would be licensed comics. Uh, popular examples today include Star Wars, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Rick and Morty. The thinking is that these all have existing fan bases that will bring in new readers. But of course, there's a fee associated with this, so making licensed comics costs more right off the bat. Is bringing in that new audience enough to offset that? Let's take a look at that today. Early comic publishers like Dell Comics in the Golden Age, Gold Key in the Silver Age, or Now Comics in the 1980s, existed primarily to adapt properties like Looney Tunes, Disney, Star Trek, and Terminator into comic book form. These days, companies like Boom Studios, Dynamite Entertainment, and Titan Comics all have more than half of the books they put out as licensed comics. Even larger companies like Marvel and DC, who primarily have their own creations, will put out some licensed comics, like Star Wars and Hanna-Barbera modernizations. Although, there's a good chance both of those cost less, since the parent companies behind Marvel and DC, Disney and Warner Brothers respectively, own that intellectual property. A quick look at the top 500 comic books sold last month shows me that about 80 of them were based on licensed properties. That said, only 17 of them were selling over 10,000 copies a month. How can something like Dynamite Entertainment's Green Hornet or Boom Studios' Planet of the Apes, which both sold under 4,000 copies, be profitable after paying for the talent, license, and printing costs? It must be small margins. I'm convinced that a lot of smaller companies have existed on small margins with the hope of their licensed comics picking up media attention from time to time and attracting new readers. I can't find any evidence to back up my hypothesis, but one thing I do know is that these comics probably aren't paying their talent very much. And if a book isn't selling very well and you're not paying the talent a lot, well they're not going to be very passionate about it, are they? I want to take a look at some of the most bizarre examples of bad licensed comics out there today. In 1978 and 1979, Marvel successfully launched comic book adaptations of Micronauts and Rom Space Knight. Perhaps part of what made these toy adaptations successful was that they were set within the Marvel Universe and interacted with its superheroes regularly. In 1982, Editor-in-Chief Jim Shooter tried to adapt another toy line called Team America. Everyone, don't worry, everything is boom. We stopped the terrorists. Uh, no, no, this one predates that. Team America began as an evil Knievel set of toys in 1972. But in 1977, Knievel pled guilty to battery and lost all his endorsement deals. It took Ideal Toys a while, but eventually they decided to recolor the existing toys and call it Team America. Jim Shooter loved the idea and adapted it into a team of motorcyclists who were constantly being chased by Hydra, usually an enemy of spy agency S.H.I.E.L.D. The team was initially comprised of leader Honcho, a former CIA agent, Wolf, a former biker from L.A., and Are You Ready, a former rock star. That's right, all three bikers had former amazing jobs, kind of like pro wrestlers in the 80s with jobs as repo men, dentists, and evil accountants. They also frequently met the masked biker with amazing skills known only as the Marauder, and the comics kept the mystery up until the final issue revealed who the Marauder was. 
And while it at first appears to be Georgina, the girlfriend of one of the team, a rogue Hydra leader then tells them that Honcho, Wolf, and Reddy are actually mutants, and their power is to project all their skills onto another person. The book was not a hit, and it struggled to reach 12 issues. The toy line was dying, the fad was at the end of its life. It wasn't a great time to try to launch this idea. Maybe five, ten years ago, it might have been a hit. But in 1982, it kind of bombed. These days, they're really just a footnote in the Marvel Universe. But that wasn't the only thing that Jim Shooter came up with. Jim Shooter was the ninth editor-in-chief at Marvel. But his leadership style began to drive away some top talent like Marv Wolfman and John Byrne, and he was fired in 1987. Marvel was up for sale in 1989, and Jim Shooter brought together several investors who ultimately put together the second highest bid. Following that, he formed Valiant Comics in 1990. In 1991, they successfully launched a superhero line, but for about a year before that, they mostly survived off of licensed comics like the Ultimate Warrior's Workout comic. Another bizarre license was for Nintendo's Game Boy. Not Super Mario or Zelda or some of those amazing characters found in Game Boy games. No, this was about the Game Boy itself. How do you make four interesting issues about the Game Boy? You don't. This comic begins with a guy named Herman playing his Game Boy, and then bragging to his pet rat that he just got to the final level of Super Mario Land, but intentionally let Mario die. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? Playing a game for hours and hours and then intentionally losing right at the very end? I mean, the only thing that could top it is maybe excelling at your job, your career, for 20 years, and then just going out and taking a big dump on your desk in front of everyone and getting fired, and then going home to brag about it to your pet rat. Herman continues to prove himself wildly unlikable by being terrified of a homeless man asking for spare change, then saying that beggars should all be shot. This leads the homeless man to stick up for himself by shouting that he's a vet that just doesn't have a job, so Herman cowers and gives him a quarter. Of course, that was back in 1990, so a quarter then is worth up to 25 cents today. Herman gets to his job at the mall at a place that's basically Radio Shack. He lies to his boss that he was nearly mugged and had to fight off a group of people. He starts ranting to his boss that if he was in charge, every litterbug, jaywalker, mugger, and liberal politician would be strung up. Killing litterbugs? That reminds me of a guy we recently covered. <laughs> Herman's boss heads out for an errand and mentions that a Game Boy is missing. We now see Herman taking one and saying he stole it, and he'll steal another. This is an interesting way to promote the Game Boy. Hey kids, why not try shoplifting? Fortunately, the book now cuts to some slightly more likable characters, brothers Rick and Josh. Their mom drops them off at the mall, and Josh just wants to play video games, but Rick is interested in following girls. You can tell he's a stud because of his pop collar and sunglasses. There's a small thunk sound effect the boys ignore, and we next see that Herman has been captured by a massive army of Nintendo monsters that are coming out of his Game Boy. Thunk. The alien warlord Tatanga is a tiny purple Muppet man who has captured Princess Daisy and reveals that he hypnotized Herman to escape from his dimension into another one to conquer it. Again, is this how you try to sell a Game Boy? Hey kids, buy one! Monsters might come out of it and try to kill you. Tatanga's monsters cause chaos in the mall, but nerdy Josh recognizes them and knows who can help. Rick guesses on who they can call. Not the police, but Hulk Hogan or Chuck Norris. Josh prays to his Game Boy, and a tiny Super Mario emerges to fight Tatanga. Tatanga takes Daisy to the World Trade Center for lunch, and they begin destroying it. But of course, Super Mario is more than enough for Tatanga's minions. Herman shows up to hit Mario with a lunch tray, but Mario finds an invincibility star, just like in the game, and Tatanga and Mario jump back into the game. This comic is certainly better timed than Team America, I mean, the Game Boy had only come out in 1989 the previous year. At the same time, it didn't have any top-tier talent to draw in new fans, and nobody wants to read a book where they feel like they're being advertised to. But, this isn't the worst example of a licensed comic. 
Now Comics began putting out comics in 1986, and pretty much their entire line was based on licensed properties, from Speed Racer to Ghostbusters to Terminator to Married with Children. In 1993, they put out one of their most infamous books, Mr. T and the T-Force. This was based on Mr. T, who was certainly an icon, but whose most popular work was about a decade old now. The days of Rocky III and the A-Team were in the past but now pushed Mr. T hard, and Mr. T was game to promote his comic. So the best thing that ever happened to me, I've been teamed up with Now Comics. You know what the slogan is, now is better than ever, and I pity the poor competition. All the other comic books, get out of here. I'm with Now, so that's what it's gonna be. Don't forget it. Huh. This comic has one thing going for it, artwork by Neil Adams, who was pretty much THE superstar artist of the 70s and is still quite talented. But the story is bizarre. Mr. T begins the issue smashing a car and fighting drug dealers operating on the street in broad daylight. Mr. T's strength levels are off the charts as he smacks attackers out of the air. Eventually, Mr. T seems to get tired of beating people up and orders the last drug dealer to follow him to a nearby dumpster where he uncovers a crack baby and demands that the drug dealer take care of it and make something of his life. So why does Mr. T trust a random criminal with a baby's life? Well, it turns out Mr. T had somehow recorded the whole thing and he has a VHS tape that he can blackmail the criminal with. On top of that, he lifts his gold chains and pulls out something he calls the T-Force, which essentially is some sort of a GPS tracker. So Mr. T puts this criminal under a civilian's house arrest, I guess we'll call it, and then if that doesn't work, he always has blackmail to fall back on. Uh, the comic book was not much of a hit. It lasted not quite a year, and then now comics entirely folded. They went out of business. So, you know, I don't know what it necessarily takes to make a licensed comic successful, probably top-tier talent and good timing, but we can identify some of the reasons why a licensed comic will not be successful. Timing. You have to get in there while the property is hot or when nostalgia has brought it into the zeitgeist. Talent. People that read comic books want to see good writing and good artwork. We're not going to settle for any less. At the end of the day, there's got to be passion between both the creators and on behalf of the fans to make something successful. So those were some examples of bizarre licensed comics that I could find, but I'd love to hear from you. What were some of your favorite licensed comics, and what were some that you just don't understand how they can be popular? You know what? Growing up, I got into comics because I loved Transformers and G.I. Joe. And looking back, especially that G.I. Joe comic, that holds up. That was well-timed, it had good talent, the people behind it were passionate, it had a good premise, the fan base was engaged, and, you know, it's still being published today. So, that's an example of something that works. But for everyone that works, there's probably 20 that didn't work, and a lot of them we just forget. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Let's take a look and see if we have any fan art. We do have some fan art this week. Chris Burbridge makes a return, and he's based this amazing piece off of Destro in his weapons wheelbarrow from the recent G.I. Joe episode that I made. I love it. Patrick Spore sent me a really cool piece saying that it's his first attempt at drawing in a really long time and that both he and his wife enjoy the show. Thank you so much, Patrick. I love it very much. Miles Durkey returns, and it looks like he's drawn Infotron. He's my robot sidekick that we haven't seen in quite a while, but I love this interpretation. He looks fantastic. J. Andrew World sends this piece of me looking incredibly cool and powerful over the city. That is one of the coolest looks I've ever had. And finally, this piece isn't exactly related to comic tropes, but it was inspired by my recent episode about Steve Ditko. That's by Gabe White. I really enjoy that, so I thought I'd share it with everybody. So that means we've actually got two entrants this week to see who will win the Gachapon Prize of the Week, because the art has to be about the show specifically, and both uh, Miles and Chris tell me that, like, because they've actually won before, that they're okay not being in the running. So, I'm going to flip a coin. Uh, heads will be, I'm looking at these, okay, heads will be Patrick Spore, and tails will be J. Andrew World, okay? Heads is Patrick, tails is J. Andrew, 
It is tails. It is tails. So, let me grab a gachapon. All right, the gachapon bag from Japan. Let's see what we got in here this week. J. Andrew World, you won this Star Wars piece. Hey, that's appropriate. Licensed Comics, Star Wars. Yeah, this is a, a Death Star that each piece comes off and inside there's some sort of a, a Star Wars ship that you can build. So, I will send that to you, J. Andrew World. Uh, thank you everyone for the fan art. Thank you everyone for watching. The channel continues to grow. It's really encouraging. So, we've got some great episodes coming up on some important creators, on some important publishers, slightly more of that documentary, mini documentary feel. Um, but I can't do those every single week because they require a lot of research and, you know, I've got a full-time job, so I don't have time every week to do sort of a, um, a real deep dive like the Steve Ditko episode, for instance, or the episode on the history of comic book lettering. Those tend to take me a little longer, and I sort of have to work ahead on them. So some weeks I have to do something that's a little lighter, like looking at one particular comic book and trying to use that as a lens for the techniques a creator or a character would use. Just trying to explain a little bit of what's going on in the show. Um, thank you to all my new patrons on Patreon. That's been incredibly rewarding to know that so many people appreciate what's going on here. I'll keep doing it. Thank you all, and remember, until next week, keep reading comics.